All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm so excited to welcome you to Is Resistance Futile? And we're going to be here today to talk about what it means to adopt new technology, especially AI, which we're required to talk about, while maintaining our autonomy, our humanity. Um, and we're going to do that through the lens of Star Trek. So I'm going <laughs> uh, to introduce our illustrious panel. Uh, Ben Carlson is the Associate Director for Scholarly Data and Innovation here at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School, Biddle Law Library, where he oversees scholarly communication, archives, and implementation of new technologies in the law library. In this role, Ben focuses heavily on the use of technology to automate collection, organization, and dissemination of faculty scholarship. He has presented on API integration, web scraping, and Python automation for libraries. Emily Florio is Director of Knowledge Research at DLA Piper, a top five AMLAW firm with 1,700 lawyers, and is responsible for the creation, implementation, and leadership of research and resource solutions within the firm, including, as we'll hear about today, co-counsel from Case Text. As a key component of the firm's knowledge team, she encourages a knowledge sharing culture that helps the firm's lawyers and business professionals practice smarter. And she's also, of course, a past president of the American Association of Law Libraries. Carla Whale is director of the Graduate Law Librarianship Program, an associate teaching professor, and associate dean for Gallagher Law Library and Information Systems at the University of Washington. Under her leadership, the UW Law Librarianship Program curriculum was modernized to include data science, data curation, law teaching practicums, and legal informatics, and Gallagher Law Library has begun pivoting to a public interest technology model, including working on several AI-based initiatives, which we'll chat about a little bit today. All right. so. That's our away team. Let's get into it. Um, and I want to start by talking about what I think is probably many folks' favorite iteration of Star Trek, which is the next generation. And in particular, I want to talk about one of the most lovable, popular forms of AI in Star Trek, which is Data. Data is a highly sophisticated android. In fact, he's so sophisticated that no one, aside from his mysterious creator, Dr. Noonien Sung, knows how his positronic brain really works. Um, so one of TNG's very best episodes, which you should all watch, uh, which is called Measure of a Man, it focuses on a legal dispute, uh, whether or not scientists from the Federation should be able to dissect, to take him apart and dissect him to figure out how his positronic brain really works, to look into the black box of his mind. So like data, large language models, we often think about having a black box problem. Uh, we can't always articulate or pinpoint how they arrive at their decisions. So with that as my, as my lens, I want to ask Carla, what do you think legal educators sh should know or try to know about large language models before we put them to use? And would that depend on what that use might be? So these are my opinions and my alone, <laughs> except they're not really mine alone. Um, I think the notion that LLMs will displace humans is pretty premature and quite overblown. They're not as smart as we think they are. They're not sentient beings, as Pablo mentioned during the keynote. They're good at writing and saying what the answer should read or sound like, but not necessarily what the answer should be. Right? That depends on the inputs. But they will disrupt the labor market, including the legal profession. Um, I don't think they'll replace lawyers anytime soon in terms of knowledge, critical thinking, and nuanced decision making. But lawyers who use LLMs as an amplifying tool will replace lawyers that do not. Uh, it's imperative that those of us in legal education begin thoughtfully integrating the use of these tools into our curricula to train the next generation of lawyers to be practice ready, which is required by the ABA and, again, the labor market. Uh, legal educators ignore these tools at our own, par own peril, um, and we have to really start teaching students not only what they are and how to use them, but what are their limitations Ooh, what are their ethical obligations in using them in best case scenarios? We've seen, what, two incidents in the last two weeks of lawyers relying on hallucinations for citations for their work product. 
I personally think that that's, in fact, not an AI problem. Mm, that's a <laughs> <clears throat> rules of professional conduct problem. But, you know, I think about examples are, as Genevieve mentioned, the black box problem. What's in the training data in the data set? Often these systems hide biases and other faulty assumptions that are basically hardwired into the system. Just because you can see what you entered uh, does not mean that the, that was the prompt that was fed in. Um, are there copyright issues at play? Someone had mentioned this earlier in the week. Uh, and I would actually say, it was mentioned that, well, it's transformative, probably not a big deal. I would actually argue in the wake of Warhol Foundation versus Goldsmith a few weeks ago, it's not clear that transformative infringement will carry the day. We don't know. So that is actually something we have to continue to think about, um, especially in, in uh, a world where there's a lack of a policy statement from the Copyright Office at this moment. But I also see this as LLMs are not dissimilar from the advent of the internet, Westlaw, Google search engine, et cetera. We must continue teaching students these tools should be integrated within a quality assurance framework and that their job is to be in control of the quality of the work product. Keep in mind it's still unregulated in the US, but We'll see what Europe does. They're uh, really leading the charge in terms of probably going to pass EU the AI Act uh, requiring risk assessment before these tools are released. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna jump a little bit from the next generation. We're gonna, we're gonna open, open things up a bit. Um, in, data is one example that we see in track of where AI takes a human form visually. Uh, data is one example. The emergency medical hologram, for those of you who've watched Voyager, is another great example. And in these plot lines where these characters appear, uh, the humanness of the artificial intelligence is a big plot point. And the ability of the other characters to recognize these artificial life forms in their striving to be more human or to, to seem more human is part of their kind of heroic arc. They become more virtuous by embracing the humanity within the artificial life form. But based on a lot of the conversations we've had here at Cali, uh, that arc is not playing out in our relationship uh, with AI yet. So I want to ask Ben, when we were thinking about the humanness and the seeming, the, the risks that we perceive in AI as coming across as being too human and, and, and falsifying its artificialness, how should we establish the limits of our systems and train future lawyers how to think about correspondence with AI? Um, my favorite part, of, going back to what Carla referred to, the, you know, the recent uh, drama with the lawyer relying on hallucination citations, and my favorite part of that, I agree with Carla that it's not uh, an, AI, an AI issue as much as it's a you know, checking your sources issue and it's an ethical obligations issue. But what's most interesting to me about it is that is, was his, def his initial defense, which was, I asked it. I didn't just rely on citations it gave me. I asked it, are you sure that these are right? And it said yes. How, why would it lie about itself? So that I know this example of this lawyer seems extreme, and he's a great poster child for what to watch out for. But it's, it's a real problem because the AIs like the emergency medical hologram, um, as you can imagine, Robert Picardo, who did a great job portraying that role, always wanted to be convincing. And you know, he was a he, he was not a biological being; he was generated. But he was also had to instill confidence as a as a doctor on the ship. Uh, AIs are all generally being programmed to be convincing, to uh, defend itself against accusations of falsity. Uh, these are things, I mean, they don't have to be programmed that way, but they could be. And so it's important to work that into how we're preparing people to deal with them. Um, in the law, the information literacy is a survival skill. Uh, law schools need to get out in front of this. Legal practice technology classes are now an absolute necessity to produce practice-ready lawyers. Uh, a modern LPT class would likely dedicate an entire section of the syllabus to the understanding, uh, ethics, and practicalities of AI and legal practice. 
uh, law students who go into practice with a working grasp of what AI systems can and can't do and what they can and can't be trusted to do uh, and what to do with an AI generated answer are going to be much better prepared. Honestly, the most important thing that all law students can leave law school with is to be information literate. Well, I want to now turn to Emily receiving these lawyers uh, on, on once they've crossed the bridge to practice. What kind of training do you see as the most vital for new lawyers to come in with to evaluate these systems, uh, either as a firm or in partnership with the vendors who you work with? Sure, so obviously I agree with Carla and Ben. Um, I see these tools like co-counsel, which we are using as an amplifying tool or a, you're going to be using it. If you ignore it, it's not going to go away. If I feel like if firms are, and lawyers just think, oh, it's a passing fad, it's not gonna happen. I don't actually know that anybody believes this, but I'm sure those people exist. You're going to be left behind and you're going to do yourself a disservice. And how that actually works in practice and in law firms that is still being figured out as we go along. Right now, we are still working with just a small group in our firm with co-counsel. And obviously, we'll look at the other sort of Lexus and TR tools when they come out. They're just not, they're not here yet. Um, and so we are choosing to embrace it head on, both in the research team and the larger knowledge, depart knowledge department that I'm in because we, we feel that it is essential, even if everybody else isn't ready for it, we are. Um, it will be essential to teach at least the basics of how these tools work and how they can, to use Carla's word again, amplify your practice and make you more efficient and effective. I would imagine there are probably some people that, that are going into the hype that it will replace them, and so if they ignore it and they stick to their guns, they'll be able to stay relevant forever, but I think that is the opposite of what is true. And we're not ignoring the fact that it could decrease the billable hour or, or any of those things, but I don't think someone's workload is going to go away. I think they're going to become more productive and have more value to the firm and to their client if they embrace these tools because for many low-level associates, their work is being written off anyway so right, so this is a way to get to the bulk of what you're trying to do and show your value more be without having to do that low level work you don't necessarily want to do. We're also concentrating or, I mean, it, it honestly it changes every week because co-counsel is being developed so quickly. But early signs point to prompt engineering in these tools as being a crucial component of learning how to use the tools. So not just how they work, because they are relatively straightforward, but actually how to interact with the system to get to, the, to what you're trying to find. Um, and, and truly what we're also seeing is even if the interface is pretty straightforward, it is not plug and play. You're not going to just sit there and put everything you need into the system all day and then never have to do any work it still requires your legal know-how to do it. And so trying to find the balance of how to use it in the practice um, across all of the practices, right? I think we, we often think about Lexis and Westlaw as being really on the, more on the litigation side, but truly a tool like co-counsel or some of these other ones also have components that are relevant on the transactional side with deals and things like that too. So, we're seeing that it's going to impact everyone and that the training is going to be crucial. We're just, we're really making it up as we go each week because there, at least in my time, there hasn't been something that is being done and uh, worked on and updated every week so quickly. Thank you. Before we leave this general topic and AI, Carla, I heard that you have an AI strike force. Could you tell us about that? <laughs> sure. Which I'd one of these characters to. is you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do. Um, I guess I'll just admit it. I conscripted a group of law librarians a couple of weeks ago um, to basically form a strike force to evaluate ideas for 
vetting, <clears throat> evaluating, and possibly creating and implementing various AI-related initiatives into law library operations, services, and curriculum. A couple of examples. Mm, I gotta decide how much I wanna disclose to y'all. <laughs> it's a strike force. Um, but a couple of examples we, we, that are in various stages from that vetting to actual creation uh, include um, a new site, a portal, that Jonathan Franklin created called the Washington Online Law Finder. For you academics, you're gonna feel my pain when I tell you. It's in beta, it's great. We're trying to figure out how to work with around procurement uh, to pay for the sort of monthly support that we need to keep the site going. Um, but what we're talking about for the next step uh, for Wolf, catchy, Huskies, Wolf, um, is that instead of the way it works now, which is you put in a keyword and it searches content from multiple authoritative sites, and then we also have APIs for VLEX and, and Unicorn that feed into the portal, um, and you will get results based on the keyword in different boxes for each of those sources. But what we are starting to work on is using AI to actually help pull from all of those sources, curate an answer, and give us something nice and neat in one particular response um, with a public, uh, public user interface. That's what it's for, is basically for the public. Another thing that we are working on is possibly, I'm hopeful, uh, creating a closed GPT system for internal research memos. Um, and that's just because questions and research requests are cyclical. They come, they go, they come back, they go, they come back. Uh, and this also really helps mitigating the loss of institutional knowledge as people come and leave. It will help, we hope, with uh, imp to improve training for new law librarians as well as we have, we have interns that come in and cycle in every year. Um, and my favorite, deduplicating work. Um, and then a couple other ideas are we have a, a very well-known East Asian law collection, so we're sort of vetting, is there a way to actually use some translation services as well as um, generative AI, um, in particularly maybe in partnership with one of our partner schools, Hanoi Law University. And a thing that I'm just gonna call the Purple Book Bot, which is a citation uh, bot based on this thing that we're just calling the Purple Book, uh, which is the nascent work of David Ziff, um, essentially to perhaps convince the uh, reporter of decisions in the state of Washington that the style sheet, maybe, oh, I'm at Penn, shouldn't be based on the Blue Book. And especially because right now it's based on the white pages. That's not for practitioners. Um, but I think the idea is that if we can create a purple book bot that's pretty easy to use and is open and available to everyone, that might really help that conversation for the report of decisions move a lot quicker further. So those are just a couple of ideas. I have more, but I, I will not go through them. Well, thank you. I've, I've put your name on a list to report to the Blue Book folks. Um, <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> All right. so, um, on that note, let's get darker. Um, I wanna pivot and talk about the Borg. Um, so, for, for, for any of you who don't know, the Borg are uh, a collective of humanoid life forms um, from across the galaxy who have been forcibly joined together uh, using cybernetic implants to create a hive mind. And their hive mind allows them to take the biological and cultural and technological distinctiveness of every person who's added to the collective and uh, wipe out their individuality and bring them together and, th and join forces in a way that allows them to adapt to changing circumstances, to build more powerful weapons, to transverse the galaxy at transwarp speeds. Um, and they are very powerful and they are the enemies of our heroes in the Federation. Um, and so while the Borg do not have, let's say, artificial intelligence, they are kind of like a large language model in that Consolidating information from many sources is the source of their strength, their, their brute force. They use it to wield power. So I would like to ask um, our panelists, what lessons do you see for us in trying 
I'm going to start with you, Ben, to harness the power of assimilated knowledge that's drawn from a large pool. Um, this is a really important question. I, um, on, on Next Generation, when the, the, um, the B&Q uh, introduces the board to humanity, he calls them uh, the ultimate user, which is, I think, a really good analogy for what we're seeing with LLMs. They are just sucking in content. Uh, and at, their power does rest, in, in, theoretically at least, in the, um, the quantity and variety of content that they're ingesting. That, that not only improves their ability to turn questions into answers, uh, it improves their ability to, to use more maybe convincing language, uh, depending on how they're programmed, uh, as referring to what I was saying before about really being convincing and, and defending themselves and, and seeming like an authority. Um, we all know, though, that quantity is not quality, and these questions are already coming up. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about copyright, uh, but also it's just about what data is going in there. What is the corpus of data? An LLM that ingests the entire internet as a source of truth may spout out proper popular fringe conspiracy theories as absolute fact. And, and as an example, another example from Next Generation, the Borg itself uh, was nearly destroyed from within after it, simul it assimilated Captain Janeway, who had infected herself uh, with a pathogen to kill them. Uh, so there is, uh, there is precedent in Star Trek, and we're starting to see examples in the world. Um, I just read a report the other day that uh, LLMs sometimes uh, are now sometimes suffering from what they call model collapse. If they start ingesting AI-generated data too much, it's actually kind of pushing out the reliable human data and is just turning into a feedback loop that's getting less accurate. Uh, so there's a lot of considerations as far as the corpus that's being fed into the AIs that needs to be vetted. Uh, a, a clear understanding of what is going into an AI is part of vetting the tool. Uh, in legal research, we talk about scope notes. Uh, it's, I don't know how much this gets talked about anymore. I haven't taught legal research in a few years, but it really is important in Westlaw and Lexis to know exactly what's included. Um, and I feel like I, I started to watch those get less and less accurate, but in, in AI, <laughs> these LLMs should have clear statements, and if they don't, it is a red flag, a clear statement of what exactly has been ingested into this to feed out data. Um, and without that, I think we should be very cautious about the, the reliability of anything we are getting. While we're talking about the reliability and, and the, the scope note and the clarity about what goes in, um, another facet of that is, of course, the, when, in the firm context where privacy and security are super important, uh, how are firms partnering with AI vendors to wall off their data, their training sets, their materials, um, to make sure their work product is not being used to, say, train the comp competition? So, Emily, could you speak about that? Sure, and I, back to what Carla said, I guess it, it's nice to know that firms aren't the only ones trying to work around procurement, because that's a large part of my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in firms, any new product goes through a very rigorous procurement process, and I don't mean just the, the terms and conditions, I mean the, we have privacy counsel, so practicing lawyers in the privacy <clears throat> practice that review our contracts, um, along with the information security team that's in IT. And so something like co-counsel or any other product out there that has this component, certainly anything that's um, ingesting client data uh, or using your search strength to somehow make it better are, are hugely, huge, um, significantly reviewed. Um, we rely on the Office of General Counsel to have a statement about what what our attorneys or staff should or should not be using in the public space, right? So we, we don't want you to use ChatGPT, the free version of ChatGPT for any of your client work. No, just don't. Uh, though we, we, we've all read the news to know that people do, <laughs> um, and they shouldn't. Um, and so we do have um, tools, right, that are reviewed and one benefit of, of, of paying the money is that our data is walled off from the rest of the corpus of the documents in something like co-counsel or Lexis and Westlaw when the, when the time comes. And so our, what we're putting into the system and however we're using it is not being used to better train the system. 
so we can rest assured that our data is on its own server that is unreachable by anyone else. And so it, we go through that process before we even start using, start using the tools. Um, we also, our research team, or the research and knowledge team had time with these products to ask a lot of these questions that we knew the lawyers would be asking. You know, what, what, is, what corpus of information is, is this trained on? Um, are there secondary sources? Is it just primary sources? When was the last time that it was updated? Um, is our data, is what we're putting in and how we're interacting with it helping, helping train it to make it better? Um, <laughs> sort of tangentially related is a topic that is changing all the time, but I guess AI is just changing all the time, every day. Um, we've been talking a lot about outside counsel mm -hmm. guidelines and what you can and can't, what our lawyers can and can't do with, for certain clients. And we've so far seen it both ways, which is of course how it's going to go. Where on one side we have clients that are saying, no, you can't use any AI machine learning product on our, on our work. How we're actually going to manage that, I'm not sure. Since we've all been using things like Lex Lexus and Westall that have had machine learning for so long. That's a whole thing. But then on the flip side, I think we're going to see clients that are saying, well, I fully expect you to use whatever the newest, brightest, best thing is out there because why would I be paying you to not be efficient and effective? If you have these tools, we want you to use them. We don't want to be paying you for the menial work if some of it can be done by a computer. So it's, back to your question, it's privacy and security, but it's also making sure that we're growing with how things change and Somehow, somehow meeting all the needs of all the clients that are on <clears throat> two very broad spectrums at the moment and changing every day. No problem at all. Yeah. So, Carla, in the academic context, um, here's a leading question. How careful should we be about vetting the quality of information that goes into the large language models that we're developing to avoid misinformation? And who should get to decide what information sources like qualify for inclusion? I think we actually have to be very careful um, about vetting the information and curating uh, that goes into LLMs in the legal space in particular. Um, for example, recently, I won't say what it is, but I was using a new legal aid, legal study aid, AI, which I am quite sure my students were already using screen quarter. I just asked it a very basic question that I absolutely know the answer to in all the nuances. Does copyright law apply to libraries? And the answer was no, <laughs> due to fair use. And I almost passed out. Um, wrong, 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 wrong. You know, that's kind of a silly low stakes example, um, but it illustrates the point. But when we're talking about legal LLMs, Right, the stakes are really high. We are talking about, for lawyers, ethical considerations, perhaps loss of uh, income, licensure, malpractice, et cetera. But I think the other thing to really think about for high stakes is that if lawyers are relying on bias or incorrect information, the stakes are super high for their clients, right? We're talking about potential loss of property, liberty, or even life. And I think that we don't talk about that piece enough. So it's really critical that we carefully, again, vet and curate what's going into anything used in legal. Um, who should do that? I mean, I'm biased, but I think it's actually information professionals, data scientists, and lawyers um, in a combination, right? You actually need all of those skills together, I think, to actually um, Again, it's about quality, uh, quality assurance, that the inputs are of the best, most accurate, and highest quality resulting in the outputs from these systems. Thank you. So we're gonna pivot again. Um, I wanna talk about Star Trek's vision for humanity. Uh, so if you watch Trek, you'll know that uh, th occasionally there's like an intra-galactic war, but uh, 
putting that aside, most of the time the vision for the 23rd, 24th century is pretty rosy, right? So there's uh, time for winemaking, there's time to uh, free climb El Capitan, uh, there's time to be a writer, uh, and what makes all of these narrative possibilities work is that there is technology to create a post-scarcity society where we, uh, we don't have a lot of the concerns that um, lead to the, you know, the third, the third World War III and uh, the Irish reunification of 2023 and all of the other uh, things that happen before our narratives unfold. So I want to talk now about how new technologies, especially AI, could create new narratives for us in law. So if you don't mind, Carla, I'm going to throw it back to you. And I want to talk about you know, we, however our new AI tools that we're, we know are evolving very quickly are, are running or implemented. How do you think it's going to change the nature of lawyering? And what, how will that change what it means to educate lawyers well? So I think it changes the nature of lawyering, just going back to the first, maybe even the first or second <clears throat> point we talked about is the amplifying tool, right? And doing some of the task that otherwise perhaps were menial and really um, time intensive. Um, in terms of what that means for legal education, I think that we have to replicate what that's going to look like in practice in legal education, but also being mindful that we have to not just say, here, robot, robot, overlords, do all the things. Take my bar exam for me, because who even knows what that's going to look like with next-gen bar. Um, I mean, it's, you know. Daniel, great, cool piece that you wrote, but I even asked LinkedIn, I was like, what does this mean for the next gen bar? And they're like, we don't know yet. Um, can it really pass it? But I think, you know, in thinking about that in legal education, one model some colleagues and I have talked about um, is just thinking about, all right, 1L curriculum. Perhaps it's about bifurcating the curriculum. And the 1L curriculum is, there's a prohibition of the use of AI. Frankly, while you're learning, students are learning rules, principles, foundational knowledge um, that they're going to need to know in order to develop the ability to think critically and analyze like lawyers by learning those rules and principles, <clears throat> doctrines. But then courses outside of the 1L curriculum, especially those that are experiential and applied skills in nature, should in fact, dare I say, require e um, my faculty colleagues, please don't watch this, um, require integration of AI, right? So that students can learn how to actually appropriately and ethically use and leverage AI uh, and other technology, which is what we've already been doing for years as uh, legal information and legal professionals in education, but to leverage those tools to more efficiently handle tasks related to the nuanced application of those legal principles um, to varying facts and situations. You still need the lawyer, the law student, to have the ability to apply nuance and legal principles to those scenarios. But again, replacing the task and knowing how to do that before they graduate. All right, so now that we know that we won't replace the lawyers, Emily, <laughs> in the firm setting, um, what kinds of early career work do you see LLMs enhancing? Um, and how will that change operations perhaps within your department or the firm at large? And I should say that I don't believe that AI is going to replace us, librarians, associates, paralegals. There was an article the other day saying that paralegals were the next thing that were going to be replaced. Um, lawyers, it's not going to replace any of us. It will replace some tasks. What those tasks are, I think we're still figuring out because this is still relatively new in the legal space, right? Um, and so I think the routine repeatable tasks that are sort of more in those guardrails that we can put up will, <coughs> will be able to be replaced by machines of whatever capacity. Um, I feel that firms that have the AI tools and use them will need to have a lot of conversations about what that means and what needs to be taught, right? The, the, the associates are going to be neat or 
will need to know what is expected of them, right? One, yes, you can use this tool, but whether you need to have someone else review your work or whether you need to review your work, you shouldn't just be checking with the system to make sure the system didn't make something up and that it's real. Um, I think it, we will need to have conversations with talent development, professional development, whoever, whoever in your capacity handles that, about what the lawyers need to know. It's not just about the basics, it's also about ha using all the tools that are available, available to you in, in wherever you work. Um, one thing that I think sums it up pretty well, and I cannot take credit for it, but we have a team of lawyers in the firm that do data analytics and AI, and internally they call, um, are, are working with co-counsel and AI generally, they refer to it as Project Iron Man, right, where it's that you have this technology that is adding on to the human being, they're not calling it Project Terminator, right, it's not a... It's not, it's not just a machine that's taking our jobs, right? We're amplifying the roles of, of all of us in, in this capacity. Um, I feel strongly that the role of information professionals, librarians, all of us knowledge, knowledge professionals, our roles will become even more crucial, right? If we're embracing these tools and instead of being fearful of it, instead of embracing it, understanding the the iterative properties and how to make the best asks of the systems, we will still stay relevant. Ignoring it is not gonna get us anywhere, but embracing us, embracing it will, it just becomes another tool in our skill set rather than being afraid that it's going to replace us. I'll ignore the fact that you brought in other IPs besides Star Trek into the talk. Um, <laughs> This is a Star Trek talk. Um, ben, ben, where do you see the line between what we can delegate to computers or what we can, what we should work towards having computers do for us versus what needs to remain the sole province of humanity? Well, what I like about Star Trek's future is they've, humanity and, and other races have, have learned to uh, leverage technology just enough to streamline things like information access and retrieval but deliberately tend to stop short of giving any decision-making power to machines. Um, humans are very skeptical in the next generation or in next generation and other uh, Star Trek versions of uh, machines like uh, the Android data uh, that dir can direct their own actions. Um, and there's multiple examples of real concern and skepticism about uh, you know something that approaches. Uh, a being that's able to make a decision that people would rely on. Most information seeking in Star Trek is almost effortless. Um, you ask the computer a clear question and it will access its data banks and present a concise fact-based answer in plain language. Uh, it's up to the beings in charge though to decide what actions to take based on the facts available. So we shouldn't let technolo technological development determine how we use and rely on technology. Uh, LLMs will try to do, or will be developed to try to do as much as we ask them to with varying results. It's up to lawyers and firms to determine what is the work of an attorney, uh, i.e. what knowledge, expertise, and insights are humans expected to provide as legal services. With that standard in place, we can then figure out how to employ LLMs and other technology tools to fill gaps and automate tedious tasks. All right, I think we have just enough time for me to throw out the last question for which we have a great slide, which is, what does it mean? Oh, wait, oh, ah, what would it mean to live long and prosper with generative AI in our legal ecosystem? So I put the Star Trek IV. Uh, in Star Trek IV, they go back in time to 1986. Whales. It's a great movie. You should all watch it. Yes. Uh, this, this is my favorite scene. Uh, Scotty, Engineer Scotty, uh, is trying to uh, Kind of show this, uh, these 1986 people how to develop transparent aluminum, which is way ahead of its time. And he has to use the computer to do it. And so he immediately says, computer. And it doesn't respond. And he's, he's already annoyed. And then he, they tell him to use the mouse. And he speaks into the mouse. And he says, hello, computer. And it still doesn't respond. And they say, please just use the keyboard. And he's very upset. And he eventually knows, I'll get back to it. He does know how to use the keyboard. And he gets through this. But this makes me think about accessibility. And we're already to the point, I think, now where 
we're largely past these barriers of being able to talk to the machine. I mean, Siri can do that to some degree, and it's only going to get better. But Star Trek presents us a, a, a vision of accessibility, inclusion, and uh, equal access to information and e equal ability to work. Uh, and this is something that AI can help us with. Um, the potential I see in AI uh, is the removal of accessibility barriers, physical barriers of understanding, social barriers. Pablo's keynote yesterday highlighted the, uh, the true power of LLMs, which is the power to analyze, interpret, and translate language. Um, a tool that can translate jargon-heavy and verbose legal language into concepts that can be read and understood by a much wider range of people should be leveraged as much as possible to increase access to information for everybody. Do you guys have any future? <laughs> I guess I would say that it's best to embrace it rather than ignore it because it's not going away. I mean, same, which I think I've said three, four different ways. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thank, uh, thanks you all for thank you all for being here. Um, we'll stick around if there are questions. I know there's a raffle coming up that we also want to be mindful of. But nice, nice to have you with us. Thank you. <laughs>